is in the presence of the Almighty God to offer prayer. Our most beloved Heavenly Father, it is indeed a great privilege that we have to come to thee in the way of prayer. And with the great promise behind it that prayer changes things. And in this day that we are now living, there is so many changes needed. And we pray that you will change all the wrong to right. Change sorrow into joy. Change sickness into health. Change sin into righteousness. Change gloom into glory. Grant it, Father. Hear the prayers of your people as we offer it to thee in the name of the Lord Jesus, thy lovely Son. Amen. You may be seated. Mr. Moore was just this afternoon met me and he said, Brother Branham, last night you preached three sermons in one, or three different sermons. He said then tonight he met me out there and he said, you never preached three different ones, but you tried to put three in one. When I was trying to get him to speak for me tonight because of a tired throat. But it falls my lot to speak again, the Lord willing. In just a short time to recuperate after getting out to the place I'm staying, the Lord seemed to lead me to this portion of his scripture to read to you his children tonight. That's St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter, and the 41st and portion of the 42nd verse. And while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, what think ye of Christ, whose son is he? And they said unto him, The son of David. Now, I wish to take for a text the five little words out of this reading. What think ye of Christ? Today I was trying to get to you in the af afternoon service about the watch, the little mainspring in the watch, which makes all the watch what it is. I did not mean to be rude, but I only meant to show a picture of the condition of the church. We are trying to show the people what a fine case it's got on the watch. Fourteen carats. Or we might be able to show the people what a fine face it has on it. Or what fine hands it has on it or even to the little jewels on the inside. But with all this fine mechanism of the watch, it is of no value to you for time, except it has the mainspring that makes all these things work together to keep time. Today, the church is trying to show their big, fine buildings, the 14th 
14 care cases or some of them an unbreakable faith. <laughs> and many times we're trying to tell them of the rubies that we have, the gifts that are in the church. And they're all right. There's nothing wrong with them things. And when I try to explain or speak on the different gifts in the church, and how yet everybody seems, not everybody, pardon me, but many seem to be defeated while they have these gifts. It isn't because the gift is no good, it's because the main spring isn't moving it in the right way. You might shake it and make it tick a couple of times, but the main spring keeps it ticking all the time and makes it operate perfectly. Now, in this little portion of Scripture that I have here under consideration for a text, it is such a little tiny thing. Five little words. But what makes it what it is is because it is the Scripture. The valuation of the Word. The Word is so valuable. No matter if it's one little word, it's the value of the Word. The Word was in the beginning a thought of God. And then it became, after a thought, a word is a thought expressed. And when God thinks of anything, then when he expresses his thought, it becomes a signed document. And every Thing that God is worth and everything that God is is behind that word. No man is any better than his word. And all the Bible is is prophets who have went up into the place where we spoke today of the eagles and God has let them foresee what God spoke in the beginning. For in the beginning, God knew everything that ever would be from the very first beginning. So you see the value on the Word. Some time ago, I heard a few weeks ago of a little boy who was up in an attic fooling around, playing, and he ran into a little postage stand, no more than a perhaps a half inch square. And he took the postage stamp and he seen it was a no one. So he slipped out to a stamp collector and got one dollar for the stamp. That stamp collector sold it for fifty dollars. And the last time I heard from that stamp, it's worth more than a quarter of a million dollars. Now, it was not the little it's a little piece of paper that's worth so much. It's what stamps on the paper gives us its value. And our little text tonight isn't the paper that's so valuable, but it's what's on the paper that's so valuable. It's the Word of the living God that stamped on the paper when it said by our Lord, Heavens and earth will pass away, but my word shall never pass away. 
That's how infallible the Word of God is, no matter how small. Many times we think just because anything is small that it's not noticeable. But Jesus said that even a sparrow, who were two of them, sold for a fourth of a penny. And not one of those little birds could fall to the ground without God knowing it. God notices little things. Now, many times you say, I can't do very much about it, the conditions today, but just a little kind word to someone, an invitation, a little testimony, little kind smile or greeting to a passerby might mean more than you think it does. It's little. Some time ago, up in Canada, the late King George visited the province. And while he was in the province of British Columbia, all the teachers turned the children out from school that they might go and, and see the king. And being that His Highness the King was there, why well, they, they all had flags to display their patriotic feeling towards Him. And the little children were supposed to wave the flag as the King passed by. And after the King had passed by, the teacher came out. And she found one little bitty girl standing over on the corner with her little head against the telegraph pole, a weeping like her little child's heart would break. And the teacher went to her to comfort her, and she said, What's the matter, honey? Could you not wave your flag? She said, yes, teacher, I wave my flag. Well, she said, did you not see the king? She said, yes, teacher, I see the king. Well, said, why are you weeping, honey? She said, I did wave my flag, and I did see the king, but I was so little that the king didn't see me. Well, it's not that way with Christ. No matter how little you are or how insignificant you might feel to be, he sees every move you make. This little scripture tonight holds a decision for people. What think ye of Christ? Your decision on what that scripture asks, that question, will seal your eternal destination. It might mean your healing tonight, physically. Your conception of what this question is may determine whether you walk out of that chair tonight, sir. It may mean whether you rise from the wheelchair. It might mean the difference between death and life to many of you. And sinner friend, it may mean your eternal destination, what you think of it. Now, no matter how much emphasis I would try to put on it, still it is of not effect to you unless you receive it and accept it for yourself. Not apply it to some organization or some denomination, 
or to mama or papa, but it has to be applied as your own personal taste. What your thought is of Christ. What you think him to be. Do you think him to be a dead person that died 1900 years ago? Do you think him to be just another like Mohammed, Buddha, some great philosopher or teacher, some prophet or poet? Or do you believe him to be the infallible son of the living God who has raised from the dead and is here tonight present? To give to you the desire of your heart. That he said, wheresoever two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be in their midst. Now, if it is written on little paper, or whatever it is, doesn't mean so much, but it's the message that it bears. And it's a pardon for sin. It's a healing for sickness. It's a remedy for worry. Oh, it holds in it everything you need in this journey. And everything that you will need in the great beyond hereafter. All lays in what you think about Christ tonight. Now, a pardon is not a pardon unless it is accepted as a pardon. I read an article some time ago where that there was a man in the eastern country. It's been many years ago since the incident happened, but the man was guilty and was sentenced to die under a firing squad. And some good person went to work and worked around the governor of the state until finally they persuaded the governor to spare the life of the person. And when the guilty person who was really guilty was set free to give another chance to bring himself up and to make a citizen. When the man come with the pardon, the man who was to die refused to receive it. He did not want it, yet the governor had his name signed, pardon. What made the difference was the governor's name and pardon. It spelled pardon to the man if he wanted to receive it. But if he did not want to receive it, he had to pay the penalty. And the man refused it and said, I do not believe it. I will not accept it. And the man was shot the following day. Then this pardon goes back to the governor. And he had pardoned the man, yet he was a corpse. Then it was tried in the Supreme Court of the land. And it was declared that a pardon is not a pardon unless it is accepted. And salvation through Jesus Christ is not salvation unless it is accepted as salvation. Oh, if the world could only look on God's great promises and believe them that they are God's pardon to the human race. This little aged old question has been rising in the minds of people through the centuries. 
about who Jesus was. Even to this day, among many of the Protestant ranks, it is believed and taught that he was not the virgin-born Son of God, that he was only a prophet. Some time ago, when our most beloved brother, Oregon Bryce, on the platform with me tonight, and I were in Zurich, Switzerland, the famous revivalist Billy Grimm was ending up his service that Saturday afternoon. I was beginning the next day. And down in Switzerland, the state church doctrine is, under the old Swangley translation, that Jesus was the Son of God, called the Son of God, really was the Son of Joseph, called the Son of God, but not virgin born. Now, that knocks every foundation out from under Christianity. He was either the Son of God, virgin born, or His blood was no more than my blood or your blood. Sex had nothing to do with it. Almighty God overshadowed the Virgin Mary, and she brought forth the Son, Christ Jesus, by the great Macklin conception, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to form a blood cell in the womb of a girl who knew no man. And through that holy, unadulterated blood, my faith rests solemnly upon that tonight and nothing else. For my forgiveness of sin and the reason my faith is stayed there because I truly believe it was the blood of God. That's why it has a resting place. But it's so scattered today what about it? Let's just call a few witnesses for a few minutes and find out what would be said of someone who's passed on. What if we tonight could call his arch enemy, Judas Isaacarus, the very name Judas just makes us shiver. Now, the word Judas is not such a bad name. Not up to that time, perhaps many little Jewish boys was named Judas. I don't know, but perhaps come from the name of Judah, the tribe. But it was what Judas did that makes people fear and shake at the name of Judas. What makes the name of Jesus so sacred? There were many little boys named Jesus, but it was what Jesus did and what he was what makes his name so reverent tonight that all the family in heaven is named after him. Not so much of what your name is, but what you are with your name. Judas, if we could go down to the regions of the lost and the damned, if we could go to that wearisome place called hell and could call that deceiving spirit of Judas is carried to this platform tonight, it would say, Judas, what think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? I could imagine you could get 30 pieces of silver rattle across the platform and he'd say, I have betrayed innocent blood. What 
if I could go to the smoldering regions of the law and call the Roman soldier who took the spear and pushed it into his heart. I would say, what think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? He would say, truly, that is the Son of God. What if I could go to Pilate, that great emperor of Rome, go down to the regions of the lost, on a fragile man and call him here tonight before this audience. Remember, I'm calling his enemies. If I could call Pontius Pilate tonight and say, Pilate, you've been gone for 2,000 years. Wherever you have been, I want to ask you a question that you might answer this audience tonight. What's your opinion of Christ? What kind of an answer do you think he would give? When Christ was placed before Pontius Pilate to make his decision of what he thought of him, And my brother, sister, Christ is placed before you tonight to give your opinion and to make your decision. What do you think of him? And your action will speak much louder than your words. Let's look at Pontius Pilate as they drug him out one morning to sit on the judgment seat. And to be favorable to the Jews and to the Romans, when they dug Jesus up before him with the thorns on his head as a crown and his hands tied behind him, I could imagine that great emperor as he sat on his throne all discouraged because he'd been gotten up a little early and with his temper all up as he'd swing his hair back and look into the face and say they can't be much to that die. You say what a horrible person. But oh my decrepit sinner fam you do worse than that. By rejecting him. And so with his hands tied behind him, how could a king with his hands bound? That's the king of heaven. As Pilate was judging him, looking him up and down, said, if you are the Christ, why don't you say something about it? And Jesus never opened his mouth. I can imagine Pilate saying, well, he's a scared because he's standing before me, the emperor of Rome. Then all of a sudden, I can hear a horse come galloping at full speed, coming from the palace. And a young, handsome soldier jumped from the saddle into the street, up to by the guard, and they seen he was a palace guard. So they let him in. He was carrying a piece of paper in his hand, and I can see him as he walked up before Pilate, bows himself to the floor, and say, Your Majesty, sir, I have a letter from your wife. She said it was urgent for you to receive this at once. That's why I broke in like the way I did. I see Pilate open up the letter with his head back. 
And as I begin to watch his eyes under his great brow, the frown and the long eyelashes and eyebrows, his eyes goes to a cold stare. As he reads this letter, he looks around to Jesus and he looks back. His face becomes white. His lips doesn't seem to have any blood. His knees begin to knock together. What's so important about that letter from his pagan wife? Let's look over his shoulder and read and see what it says. My dear husband, don't you have anything to do with that just man? For this day I've suffered many things in a dream because of him. That's what he would say happened. What did he do? Instead of releasing him as he had power, instead of embracing him and saying, Yes, Jesus, I've been wrong. I've misjudged you, but this morning I receive you as my Savior, as the Son of the living God, I bow before you. But instead of that, he tried to justify himself like many sinners of this world today. I just won't go to the meeting. That bring me a pan of clean water. And he washed his hands of him. But I just won't accept him. But I just won't have anything else to do with it. Did that clean his hands? No. And neither will it clean your hands. It's before you. You've got to make a choice. God compels you to make a choice. You can't leave that door tonight without some sort of a choice. It's impossible. As the old legend says, Pilate many years later was in the northern countries in the mountains. He was finally dethroned and he wearied and he walked and finally committed suicide by plunging himself into a great hole of water and drowning. And it said as a legend that every year just about the time that he washed his hands of the Lord Jesus and accepted his great dignity and instead of humbling himself to the Lord, the legend says that that blue water bubbles up for hours to show him that blue clean water won't wash the blood of Jesus Christ off of the hands of any person. Neither will a name on a church book. Neither will anything else ever wash the blood of Jesus Christ off of a man or woman's hands who's heard the gospel. You've got to make your decision. There's no other way for you to do. You either accept him or you deny him. He is on your hands. And there's nothing you can do. Only make your decision. You say, Brother Branham, you've been talking to his enemy. Now, what about some of his friends? That's what his enemies had to say. Let's see some of his friends. Let's call the Hebrew children to the platform tonight. Oh, you beloved 
friends of God, what think ye of Christ? You lived many hundred years before he ever was manifested in the flesh. I can hear Shadrach say, I'll speak for the three of us. Amen. We are not divided. All one doctrine we, one in hope and charity. I'll speak for the rest. It was on a gloomy morning when we were cast into a big pit of fire of a furnace hit seven times hotter than it ever was hit. And we wondered what was taking place. We'd never felt any fire on us. Neither did we feel or hear any hair singeing. But it seemed to be very comfortable down there. And when we turned to look, there stood one that looked like to me the Son of God. That's what we think of him. Ezekiel, the prophet that we spoke of today, what think ye of Christ, Ezekiel? Whose son is he? One day said Ezekiel, while the Spirit of God was upon me, I looked up into the heavens. I saw him coming, and the clouds were like dust under his feet. I saw a wheel in the middle of the wheel, turning way up in the middle of the air. Daniel! Will you testify tonight? Most surely will I testify, he said. I stood one day while the Spirit was upon me, and I saw the Gentile world all torn together, and I beheld until there was a stone cut out of a mountain without hands. Who rolled into the image and smashed it? I saw all nations come to the ancient of day, whose hair was as white as the snow. That's what I think of him. What a marvel. Just asked his mama if anybody ought to know whose son it was, his mama ought to know. Mary, will you testify? Most surely will I testify. Mary, you are his mother. He laid the first nine months under your heart. What think ye of Christ, Mary? Whose son is he? She said, I knew not a man. But one day on the road down, the great angel Gable stood before me and said, You're going to bear a child, and that holy thing will be called the Son of the Living God. I believe her. I think the final. Notice the final word that ought to set it before all nations, both heaven and earth. Let's ask God about it. See what He says about it. One day upon the Mount Transfiguration, there come a great cloud from heaven and overshadowed them. And Jesus was set out to one side, and His raiment did shine as the sun. God, what about 
this man that the Jews turned down? What about this that the Gentiles love pleasure more than they love? Who is this? Listen to God's own word. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. That should settle it once forever. Every man or woman that's ever mounted to anything has believed that. Let's call a poet on the scene. Eddie Pruitt, he is writing was rejected. And he was a man cast out. But he loved the Lord. And he did not go to the arm of flesh. But he went to the God who answers prayer. And sitting in his office one day, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, Eddie Fruitt picked up the pen and wrote the inauguration song. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Blind Fanny Crosby, who was tortured to her life by scornful hands and making fun of her because she wouldn't write worldly songs. What saint she, Fanny Crosby, that's called you here? And what do you think of him? Whose son is he? What does he mean to you, Fanny Crosby? And when she picked up the pen, she wrote, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Thou the stream of all my comfort, more than life to me. Whom have I on earth beside thee, or whom in heaven but thee? Another wrote, living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified, freely forever. Someday he's coming, oh, glorious day. What? And whose son is he? What's your opinion of him? What do you think about him? William Branham, what's your opinion? Oh, my. If I had ten million tongues to speak with, I could never express my thoughts to him. Laying yonder on the bed, cut up out of a sinful family, and the doctors looked at me and said, you got three minutes to live. And all of a sudden, something passed my way. It was the blessed Son of God who saved me from sin and healed my blinded eyes and put me out to preach the gospel. Oh, how I love Him. How I adore Him. I couldn't express what I think of him. What kind of people ought we to be? Some time ago down in the South, they used to buy slaves. And they would sell them, just like you do on the, the market of cars. And the buyers would come by and buy those people and sell them from one place to another. And one day a slave buyer came by and those slaves were very disheartened because they were away from their home. They would have to whip them with whips to make them work. They'd never go back to see their loved ones no more. They were slaves. And they were so discouraged. But one day when a certain buyer came by a great plantation, he noticed one young man, oh, you didn't have to whip him. His chest was out, his chin was out. 
He walked right along with a smile on his face. He'd done every bit of work that he seemed to be done. The buyer said to the slave owner, I want to buy that slave. But the buyer said he's not for sale. Well, what makes him so much different from the others? Perhaps he's the boss of the others. The slave owner said, no, he's just a slave. Said, maybe you feed him better than you do the others. What makes him act like that? Said, no, he's out in the galley with the rest of them. Said, well, what makes him so much different from the rest of them? And the owner said, I wondered that myself for a long time. But I found out. I find out that over in the homeland, his father is the king of the tribe. And though he's an alien, and he's away from his father, and he's away from his tribe and loved ones, he conducts himself as a king's son. He knows that he's an alien, but he's the son of a king. Hallelujah! What kind of people ought we to be? How should we conduct ourselves? We are sons and daughters of a king. Not a king, but the king. Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, who is the king of kings. Let us pray. Our heavenly father, it is with the humble hearts that we embrace thy word and we give to thee the very adoration of our innermost being because thou hast redeemed us and we are not redeemed by corruptible things as money. We are redeemed by the precious blood of God who has purchased us through His only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus. And I believe tonight that He is God's only begotten Son, that He died for the propitiation of our sins, and He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. And the chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And with His stripes we are healed. I embrace that tonight and say He is the virgin born Son of God. Father dear, if there is people here who have been deceived, but just thinking they could join church, or could hide around some little doctrine, and be saved. Oh, may they hear the poet say, Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Grant tonight that sinners may come and be saved through the shed blood of Jesus Christ God's only virgin born son. We pray in his name and while we have her head bowed, I wonder tonight, no one here would surely have the audacity to be as pilot, would try to push back the message or say it another time. I believe you're better mental balanced than that. Would you have the courage, not to me, I'm just a man, but to God, would you raise your hand up while everyone in prayer, if you would raise your hand and say, God, this is my witness to you, not to Brother Branham or no one else, but this is my witness to you, that I believe that Jesus is your Son, he died for my sins and I now confess all of my iniquity and sin. 
Am I raising my hand? I'm saying this. I believe on him for the remission of my sin. Put up your hand. Will you do it before God? Go to have just a short prayer. God bless you, son. God bless you, sir. All right, on the bottom floor, put your God bless you, sir. God bless you, lady. God bless you, mister. God bless you. God bless you, little girl. Someone else, raise your hand on the bottom floor and say, By this God, I mean I surrender everything. Remember, friend, in ten million years from tonight, you'll be somewhere. God bless you, little boy. Up in the balcony to my left, someone say, By this I put up my hands. God bless you, little boy. God bless you, lady. I put up my hand and say, God receive me as a penitent sinner. I now raise my hand and say, I haven't lived right or true to you. And from this night on, by your help, I'll do it. The balcony is to the rear. Would you raise your hand and say, I now will put my hand to God. God bless you, lady. The balcony to the right would say, I put up my hand. God being merciful to me. I belong to church. That's true, you say. But as far as really knowing what it means to accept Christ as Savior, I have never done it. I still live the life out there in ups and downs. And I'm just, the only thing that makes me, I try to hide around the corner. Don't do this, but down in my heart, I want to do it anyhow. Brother, you're, that ain't right. You know that's not right. For the Bible said, if you love the world or even the things of the world, the love of God's not even in you. Will you put your hands up to God just as I ask God to bless you? God bless you. God bless you here, lady, on the bottom floor. I see your hand. God bless you back there, young man. I see your hand. All right. One more before we close the altar call and pray for you. Is there another some? God bless you, young lady. It may seem like, oh, is that a hard thing? Just think how simple it is. Just like this little word. Just three or four little words. But it spells your eternal destination. Your choice. You can raise your hand and receive it. You can keep your hand down and miss it. It may be your last call God gives you. Let me persuade you, if you feel led to put up your hand, no matter how long you've been in church, put your hand up. God bless you, little one. I see your hand. God bless you, sir. God sees you. Of course he does. All right. Once more, look over the audience to see if I can just ask God to bless another one that's decided for him. All right. With your heads bowed. Our most kind Father, these people who raise their hand, I believe with them as an intercessor, an earthly priest, to make intercessions to Jesus Christ who stands in the presence of Almighty God, sitting on the throne of God, making intercessions. I bring these by my message tonight of the gospel who has felt in their heart that they must raise their hands to accept you. Now we realize, Lord, them raising their hands, they break every scientific rule. They overstep gravitation and raise a hand that was made to hang down and bring it up shows that there is a supernatural spirit in there. And that spirit has made a choice for eternal life and has raised their hands towards the Creator of heaven and earth to ask pardoning for their sins. Thou hast said in thy most holy word, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, has everlasting life and shall not come into the judgment, but pass from death unto life. And it is also written from the lips of our Savior, No man can come to me except my Father draws him first. 
And all that comes to me, I'll give them everlasting life. No man can pluck them from my hand, for they are God's love gift to his Son. Now, Father, receive them into thy kingdom. Believing that each one raised her hand is now born again. And I pray, God, for them, that you will give them the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And on this new heart and new spirit that they have just received, place that teeny little Holy Spirit in there to setting that body in order. Give to them the great gifts and let them see the signs of the time. Grant it, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, my brother and my sister. Some 15, 20 hands went up. You have received now Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You did not try to wash it from your hands. You took that same guilty hand and raised up and said, God cleanse it. He that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Red like crimson, they shall be white like wool. God promised it. God keeps His promise. Now I'm trusting upon the merits of our blessed Savior that He will come here tonight and confirm His Word right publicly before you all that you might see that what you have done is not just merely a guess so or a maybe so. You confessed your faith in a living God who's right here now who puts your name on the Lamb's book of life. Now when he was here on earth, he said this, A little while in the world won't see me no more, yet ye shall see me. That's the world, the church order and the world order. They won't see me no more. Yet ye shall see me. For I, I is a personal pronoun. I'll be with you to the end of the world. I not only will be with you, but I'll be in you to the end of the world. I, Jesus, will be in you unto the end of the world. Now, friends, we've got a world tonight. A little while, and the world won't see me no more. No matter whatever takes place, they never believe it. That's the ones that Jesus spoke of. Then he also said there would be some ease to the end of the world. Yet ye shall see me. Now, he wasn't just talking to that nation there, or that generation. You shall see me, for I'll be with you to the end of the world. That's the ease to the end of the world. I trust tonight. How many, is there any here that was in my service before? Let's see your hand. Just a few. I don't claim to be a healer. I can't heal people. No one can. God does that alone. But I do confess that Jesus did die. But oh, more than that, he raised again. Amen. And he come to us to comfort us in the form of the Holy Ghost and is right with us doing the same things that he promised to do. And it's in the evening time and the evening lights are shining. I trust that you will receive him. And if he will come to this platform tonight in a vindication of the truth of his word, now, when Jesus is here on earth, he healed and done these signs that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the prophet. Now, he comes tonight and continues his work that it might be fulfilled that ye shall see me. The crowds go down the street drunk and everything else, laughing, making fun, that it might be fulfilled. The word has to be fulfilled. It must be on both sides. I'm so happy tonight that I accepted Him as my Savior, the Son of God. Now let us...
call the prayer line. And if the Lord Jesus should come and do just the things that he did when he was here on earth, he said, I can do nothing in myself, just what I see the Father doing, that I do. Looked over the audience, perceived the thought, woman touched his garments, many things as we're acquainted with from the, the previous part of the revival. May he grant it. Father God, now I have delivered to this people the message that thou hast put on my heart. And many souls has raised their hands and accepted you as personal Savior. Oh, will you tonight, kind Heavenly Father, make yourself known here and will move into the body, the body of Christ, and will show forth your resurrection until you come. And as we as believers yield our members to you, may you work through the gifts of faith and prophecy and so forth to show forth that our religion, our holy religion, is not in vain, though it be looked upon and scoffed at and seemingly to the world just a bunch of idiotic people. But you did that so that you could hide it from the eyes of the wise and prudent and reveal it to babes such as will learn. And I thank thee, Heavenly Father, that thou hast considered us and let us believe on thee. And make these young newborn babes tonight very happy. For I ask it in Jesus' name as you heal the sick. Amen. Now, A, prayer card, A. Okay, pardon me. From one to hundred. All right, prayer card, K. Is what was given out today. Let's start, what did we have last night? We've been all, let's start back from one tonight. Who has K number one? Would you raise your hand? Prayer card, K number one. I can't get them all, but all right, come right over here, ever who it is. Come here, K two. Would you raise your hand quickly now? Two, would you raise up your hand? All right, a lady over here. All right, lady, you come over here. K3. All right, four. That's good. Raise your hand quickly. Watch. Your, look at your neighbor now. You may not be able to raise up or you may be deaf and dumb and can't hear his number at all. Let's see, number one, two, three, four. Who has prayer card four? Would you raise your hand? Prayer card four. Five. Would you raise your hand? Prayer card K five. Is this gentleman here? Would you come, sir? Number six. Prayer card number six. Would you? The lady. All right, lady. Seven. All right, lady. Over here. Eight. Prayer card eight. Would you raise your hand quickly? Quickly now. You have prayer card eight, sir. All right. Nine. Ten. That's good. Quickly. Ten, eleven. Twelve. Twelve. Thirteen. Fourteen. Fourteen. Fifteen. Prayer card fifteen. Well, now look. While they are coming, if the Holy Spirit should move beyond this line, then let the deck start, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, on us uh, keep on coming. Sometimes it sets in where real good faith is moving, and they just swarm through maybe 50 or 100 at a time. But it depends on how faith is moving. Now how many does not have prayer cards, or at least you're not going to be called in the prayer line, and you'll raise your hand saying, God, I want you to heal me. God bless you. That's very fine of your faith. I do so appreciate you. And I pray now that God will bless you. Okay. Now, real reverend, I'm going to ask mothers to keep their babies just as close as you can. If you folks will just be just as reverent, sit still just about 15 minutes. See, I go from one meeting to another. See, you just seem to hear it. Then I go from here to another. 
then from there to another, then from there to another, from there to another, then overseas, oh my. You know what? One of these signs can be done in Africa, India, some of those countries, and Brother Argon by ear knows truth, that every night in Zurich, Switzerland, around 10,000 at a time would come to the altar to accept Christ. I was there five nights and 50,000 people made a decision and registered for Christ. They believe. Well, what's the matter with us? We are so dense with all kinds of doctrines and everything. Just can't get to us. We've just been churched and churched and de-churched and churched and de-churched and this and that and all this and that and you don't know what to believe. In Africa were one sign of a little cross-eyed boy first, and the next was a, a native boy walking on his feet and hands, and a few little things like that was done at the platform, not over three or four, and 25,000 people got healed at one prayer, and 30,000 come to Christ at one time. 30,000. Over as much as 10,000 of those were Mohammedans. Think of it. Mohammedans. When I met a missionary, he said, that precious jewel. Been there 30 years and won one single Mohammedan to Christ. Why? We've done everything but what Christ told us to do. You can't teach him theology. He's got just as good as you can teach him. That's right. He's got to see that God is God in a living. As one said, what can your living Christ do for me any more than my dead prophet? If your living Christ is alive, then let, him, let you teachers do what he said he would do through you, and we'll believe it. That makes the Christian keep still if he is a believer. Or the Christian says, We can produce just as much psychology and Mohammedanism as you can Christianity. That's this little gadget here, Brother Brown, that holds us on here. Said we can produce just as much psychology. We're just as happy looking for Mohammed as you are for Jesus. That we can shout just as loud as you all can. But what we want to see you do, Jesus said that if he raised from the dead and come back again in the spirit of the Holy Ghost as you say he has, he said you would do the same things he did. Now we're waiting for you to do that. There you are. But when it's really produced, they say, there goes the Koran, Jesus lives. They believe it. That's what he told us to do. Represent him. I'll be with you. God asked you to do the impossibles. That's right. God asked you to do the impossibles, and you've got to have the, the miracle-working Holy Ghost to do the impossibles. Not just a little psychic emotion, but the impossible. May the Lord grant his blessing. Be real reverent. Look this away. Believe God. Pray with all your heart that Almighty God will give to you the deep and blessed desire of your heart. That's my sincere prayer. All right. Thank you, sister. Now, will you please, just for a few moments, if you'll just sit quiet. Now, what did the angel of the Lord, how many ever read my story? Uh, he said, if you get the people to believe you. Then when I ask you to do anything, and you don't do it, to God, that is, you don't believe it. No matter what it tells you to do, Elijah told him, even go dip in the Jordan seven times. Well, he had his leprosy until he obeyed. <laughs> It's not us, it's God. Now may the Lord add his blessing.
Now, what do you say takes place? Here stands a man. I guess we're strangers to one another. I've never seen him. You've just been to church and seen me set up here. Well, I mean, I don't know you. No, no, I think about you. Now, here's the man standing here. Is Here's another Bible picture. In the book of St. John, the first chapter, when Jesus' ministry first started, Philip got converted and went and found Nathaniel. And he brought, said, could any... He come when he found Nathaniel, he was doing something. He was under a tree, perhaps praying. And Philip, being all enthused about Jesus and believing on him himself, he said, Oh, come see who we found, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. He said, Could there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? I think he gave him a, a word that all Phoenix ought to know in the rest of the world said, come see. That's the best thing to do. Come find out for yourself. Now, this man was a very staunch Hebrew. He said, could anything good come from Nazareth? said, come see. I think that is the most logical answer. And when he come, I can imagine Philip saying, now, when you go, don't be critical. Don't look for some great big something. Just look for a humble man, just like a fisherman or something. Not dressed any different than any other man, not a great high priest robe on, big turban sitting on top of his head to make him look like something. Men are not something the way they dress, they what they are, they're in their heart. And then when he come he found an ordinary man, just a clean dressed man like any other man. And he looked at him, and Jesus turned and looked at him the first time he ever saw him. He said, Behold an Israelite, in whom there's no guile. Now, he could not have been an Israelite. He could have been something else. He couldn't have been an honest man. If he had not have been, Jesus would have known it. How did he know he was an honest man? And that man had kind of startled him. He thought, that's just the man. But that wasn't the man speaking. It was God in the man speaking. And he looked at him. And he said, Rabbi, or preacher, reverend, as we'd say today, Rabbi, when did you ever know me? Why, Jesus looks at him. He said, before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. You know what that Jew said? He was a real Jew. He said, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. You're the King of Israel. Now, if he's raised from the dead, he's got to be the same in principle, the same in power, and all, because he said, the same things I do, you will also. I may he grant it. Here's a man, total stranger. I've never seen him in my life. He's standing here for some cause. I don't know. But what do I do? Just yield myself to the Holy Spirit. And then, whatever he... If this man, I don't know him, and the Holy Spirit, which is Christ in spirit form, it's just the Lord Jesus, come back in spirit form. I go to the Father, and a little while the world won't see me, yet you'll see me, for I'll be with you. All the way at the end of the world, the Holy Spirit is nothing in the world but the Spirit of Christ back working in the church. If the Spirit of Christ worked in Jesus, the Logos worked in Jesus, and He gave His blood that He might cleanse us, and God by foreknowledge set orders in the church of different things, that same Logos working in us will do the same thing. Got to. But now, if God will come and manifest Himself through the Logos, through the Holy Spirit, and will do the same thing in the same manner that he, to this man that he did to Philip, or Nathaniel, will everyone in here believe on him then? Will it confirm everything that I've said in the Word? Now see, this is God's part of the service. My part's to preach. Your part is to believe. 
God's part is to confirm. May He grant it. And the Lord bless now as we yield ourselves, soul, body, and spirit. Be real reverent. Set still. If you want to praise the Lord after something's done, that's up to you. I like you too. So I want to talk to the man like our Lord did, or look at him a moment. Now, sir, you, I don't know you and never seen you, but Christ does know you. And if he will reveal to me, uh, I don't know what you're here for. It may be finances. It may be domestic trouble. It may be sickness. It may be for somebody else. It may be for salvation. I could not tell you. I don't know. But if he will reveal to me what you are coming to ask him, you're coming to me to ask him, him to speak back. And then if he can speak through me and tell me what you're wanting, and I tell you that everything that you have need of was furnished at Calvary, then it'll be up to you to believe it. Is that right? Now, if the audience can still hear me, around the man seems to be coming a real embryolish, greenish-looking light, as he's very well aware that something's taken place. And the man is suffering. He's got something wrong in his chest and in his back and in his stomach, and in his legs, and he's a very nervous wreck that thus saith the Spirit. That, sir, is right. If that's right, raise your hand. And you receive this by an accident. You got hurt in a ditch and done this. Now, you know something's happened to you. You're healed. Just God never touched you to nothing. But you can go on your own now rejoicing and be happy. How do you do, lady? Do you believe on the Lord Jesus with all your heart? Do you believe that God could reveal to me what you're here for? I see you coming down off of a mountain. You don't live here. Oh, I believe I know you. You're from Globe. You're a woman preacher. And your church is in Miami. You've got bad breathing. And your name is Ethel Marshall. That's exactly right. You believe with all your heart? Oh, Lord Jesus, I now condemn this spirit that's cutting the breath from our sister and ask her to leave in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, sister. Go happy and rejoice in you and be blessed. Sir, do you believe with all your heart? Praying for your husband's diabetes, aren't you? That's right. Up the recording pit. Oh, Satan thought he'd get by with that, but he couldn't. Come on. Oh, if I could only have words to explain what that was. See that man, a different looking man standing here? In the field and look around that little lady sitting there praying. See that streak moving back and forth through there? Oh, isn't he wonderful? She touched something. She never touched me. But she touched the high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Have faith in God.
Now, sir, I suppose we're strangers to each other. I don't know you. And maybe you don't know me. But there's someone here who knows us both. You're a man, I'm a man. And here we stand, you're a Christian believer, and here I am a Christian. And if I could do something to help you and wouldn't do it, I'd be a brute. But I, if you're needing healing, I couldn't heal you. But if the Word, being first, says that He died for this purpose, then He will come by the Holy Spirit and do the same thing He did here on earth. That's the last and only thing He can do. He sent His Word, then He put His gifts in the church. He died for the purpose, come back and living in His church and in His purpose, doing the very same thing that He died for, confirming the Word with signs following. Of course, you're wearing glasses, but that is what you want prayer for, is your eyes. Not only that, but your ears also. That's right. Do you believe me to be his prophet? Let me tell you this, then you'll believe me. I see someone else appear. It's a friend of yours that doesn't live here. It's a person that lives in a city called Mesa. And the man's got, the person got undeveloped eyes, and you're praying for him. Is that right? Now do you believe me? Then go receive what you ask for in the name of the Lord. You believe with all your heart? Have faith then. Now you newborn babies in Christ, do you solemnly understand that the Lord Jesus you accepted a few minutes ago is right here now? Do you see what that was dealing with your heart? It was Christ. Here he is up here moving on the platform, visible, not in behind dark curtains or somewhere else, right here before you people. God doesn't go behind dark curtains to deal. That's a perverted spirit. And what is what is a perverted spirit? One that should be righteous, perverted to do wrong. Now, the lady, the lady, she, no, I thought she was deaf, but she can't speak English. You come to interpret for her. Right. Speak to her as I speak. Do you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you believe me to be his prophet? If God will tell me what you are here for, will you receive it? Now you know that I don't know you. I can't even speak your language. But the God of heaven speaks all language. You are here wanting me to pray for you for a growth. If that is right, raise up your hand. That growth is on your left breast. If that's right, wave your hand. And this is your husband, and you want prayer for him because he's got a skin disease. That is right. Then you want prayer for a son. And the reason you want prayer for him is because he walks in his sleep with his eyes open. <laughs> Receive in the name of the Lord. 
Dost thou believe on the Son of God? Now surely that would settle mental telepathy for you. We are strangers to each other. But do you believe that God is able, sir, to help me to know what you're here for? And whatever you want from Him, you have in your heart and ask him and let he then he has no voice on the earth but our voice. We are his branches. The branches bears the fruit. Our dear Lord Jesus for his goodness. You want me to pray for growth that's on you. That's right. And that growth is behind here in the back. And then you have a hernia that's to be prayed for. You believe, huh? Maybe I say this, you want me to pray for your wife too, don't you? That's exactly right. Now, I'm not reading your mind, but you couldn't hide it. You believe you receive what you ask for? Then in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, may you receive it. Amen. God bless you, sir. You believe? Don't move now. Sit still. See each one of your spirits. And every one of those spirits is right in my control, see? And I'm trying to help you. When you move that, just, I can't explain it. There's no way to try it. But what it does, it displeases the Holy Spirit. See? It displeases Him. Because I've asked you to be reverent. See? Don't move around. Sit quiet. Just a moment. All right, lady. For the boy. How would I know it was the boy? Because I see the boy right above you. Now I want to talk to you just a moment. If the God of heaven will help me to know what you want for this little lad, Will you believe that the Lord will grant it? The boy shattered. One thing the little fella has asthma. But that's not the main thing. I shall speak a word that he wouldn't understand. Leukemia. And that you might know that I am here to help you. He has a sister that's got cross eyes. Do you believe the God of heaven is close? Come here, little lad. Oh, blessed God, in the name of thy beloved Son, the Lord Jesus, I condemn this enemy and cast it away from the child by the authority of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and his divine promise which said, in my name they shall cast out evil spirits. Thou demon that would try to rob this child, leave it. We as the church of God, a jury by the living God, that you depart from the child. 
and may it be made well. My little brother, I bless thee as God's servant in the name of Jesus Christ for your healing. Amen. Don't weary, mother. Go be leading out and write me a testimony. Just a minute, lady. Wasn't you the one on the platform? You laid your hand on that man that had a blue coat on. Yes. The lady sitting on the end there suffers from a stroke. That's right. And sir, that you being your wife, your husband and wife, and you are praying for somebody else who's got a stroke. And that's your brother. And he's in California. That's right, raise your hand. Do you believe me to be God's prophet or his servant? Then as you believe, may the Lord God of heaven give it to you. You believe it, you can do it. Oh, Jesus, I condemn the devil and ask you to leave my sister in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Both leading, rejoicing, and being happy. God can heal stomach trouble just as easy as anything. Do you believe it? Do you believe that He'll make you well? Let you eat? You got all nervous. It causes a peptic condition in the stomach and ulcers. But God is able to take that out and to make you well. Of course, you got other things too, which is. A man's trouble at your age actually has. But do you believe it? He'll make you well? Then our Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I pray that you heal this man for your glory. Amen. The Lord God bless you. Do you believe that God can heal that heart trouble and make it well? Little girl, Brother Branham has a little Sarah at home about your age. And I love her. And I know Mommy and Poppy loves you, but there's somebody who loves you more than they do. That's Jesus. And in the days when Jesus was here on earth, he took little girls like you and put his hands on them and blessed them. And you believe if he was here now and put his hands on you, you'd get well, wouldn't you? Well, you know, Jesus went up to heaven in a body, but he sent his spirit back down. You believe he sent Brother Branham to lay my hands on you and you'll get well? Bless your little childish heart, honey. You shall have what you ask for. Oh, God, I now as your servant, and if I have found grace in your sight, I pray for this little girl, and I cast out this spirit that would choke her little heart down. May she live and be well. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Bless you, honey. You write her testimony, sister, and believe with all your heart. Little lady sitting right inside there looking at me. You want your eyes in your little chin. Yes. Yeah. You're sitting there praying for your eyes. That's right. Now you can have it if you believe it. Amen. You think God could heal his authorized sir? You do? When that little lady was healed, something struck you. Is that right? That light went from the woman to you. And I seen you stiffing, trying to walk. 
and you've got arthritis. That's right. And you were praying that the same thing could happen to you. Raise up your hands if that's right. All right? Now, if you believe with all your heart, you can have what you ask for. Just a moment. Oh, don't think I'm beside myself. I'm not. This little lady here is suffering with a female trouble. That's right. And way back in the back is a little Mexican woman and she's putting her handkerchief up to her face and she has female trouble. And her husband is sitting next to her, a minister. You're both healed. Christ, that streak of darkness is left and light shines over your both. The Lord bless you. Do you believe? You believe God will heal you that cancer, sir? Then in the name of Jesus Christ, Hallelujah. may this thing be done. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you, my brother. You believe? Why not everyone be healed? I want to ask you, after I leave, will you come to the altar, every sinner, and repent of your sins? Will you do it? Let's bow our heads just a moment. Oh, eternal God, bless these handkerchiefs for the healing of the sick people. And oh, Jesus, for every person that's here now that's suffering, we believe that you are the Son of the living God. You are not dead, but you are living. And you're living here innocent with us tonight, showing the infallible signs of your resurrection and declaring to us in this great dark hour, just before the breaking of day, you are proving to us your Messiahship, that you have raised from the dead and are doing the same things here that you did when you were here on earth to prove your Messiahship. We are without excuse in our unbelief. And I pray that you will take away every bit of sickness and affliction in this church tonight. All the sins in here. And I now charge the devil as being guilty of every evil thing that's represented in this church tonight. And by the prayer of faith, I ask the devil to leave every person here in Jesus Christ's name. Now, if you believe the Lord Jesus with all your heart, stand up to your feet and accept your healing, and you sinners rush to the altar for the